Okay, and I think that we are live. Look at that. Yes, we are. Cool. All right. Hey, everybody. Um, today, I have my first guest ever on my channel, um, Eric from Kraken's Garage and Adventures. And uh, Eric brings over a million miles of Ryan experience, over 45 years to the table. Honestly, that's just probably scratching the surface of what this guy brings. A lot of guys who have been riding and women as well who have been riding 20, 30, 40 years after a while, they kind of, you kind of stay stagnant and you kind of stick to what you already know and love. Um, Eric's not at all like that. He's always up to some crazy shit, basically. He rides everything from big Harleys and BMWs uh, to little mini motos. He even flew halfway across the country to buy a Vespa just to ride it back home. Um You'll, you'll come to know Eric a little bit over this video. Um, yeah, he's got 5,000 subscriber YouTube channel. Always goes above and beyond to help motorcyclists out, which is why I knew if I was ever going to have a guest on the channel, because you're the first one, Eric, uh, I had to start with you. So yeah, well, Eric, please, you. Yeah, please, in your own words, uh, just tell people a little bit about you know who you are, what you're all about. Um. It's a bit surreal for me to be on anybody's live stream. This is the seventh one I've been asked to attend, and I don't get it. I'm just a dude that turned on a camera in my garage and started to share my life story of, of two wheels. And I, I don't fit the YouTube logarithm. I'm an old white guy. I don't have any uh, physical attributes that some other YouTubers have, let's say. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and I just... It, I, I, I'm shocked that I even made it to 5,000 subs. Uh, with that said, my channel is very eclectic. It is all over the place. You'll find me very serious. You'll find complete slapstick comedy, and you'll see my adventures of wherever life takes me. And uh, I also share some of the more epic events that happen in my life, some not so good, some are funny, and, you know. <laughs> it's, Stuff uh, happens, it, good and bad, it, right? It, it's, it, it, I don't. I don't know how I'm still alive after all these years. Quite <laughs> frankly, so, so yeah. Let's let's. A, sorry, go ahead. I'm a very I'm a very humble guy, and I try to help every person in my path, and all the viewers that reach out to me, and correspondence that I get. Uh, it's it's been an incredible journey. Let's kind of start at the beginning because I think one thing that I totally misassumed about you that I got wrong. Uh, because I, I kind of saw some of your stuff and I knew that you had your father rode, that your uh, stepmother rode. So I just assumed this guy was born in motorcycling. You know, he just was born and landed on a motorcycle. But that totally wasn't the no. case at all. No, not at all. Uh, my parents were divorced when I was born. My mother had me in hopes of saving the marriage. That didn't happen. <clears throat> so as soon as I was born, the, the marriage So getting into motorcycle from, uh, of course, all the gals in my life, my two sisters and my mother and the maid. But uh, so I had to swim upstream, and that's part of the reason why I started my channel. And I, I started it with a mini moto and trying to teach young people how to wrench when, you know, my gosh, what an advantage these folks have to have YouTube. Uh, I, I had to pick up books and learn and make mistakes <laughs> year after year after year to get to where I was trying to go. Books, imagine that, uh, eh? <laughs> So, you know, those videos have been wildly popular, 20, 30,000 views, you know, but I'm still six foot four, 210 pounds, and riding a mini moto is challenging. Let's just put it that way. Uh, so with that said, I'm not doing too much mini moto stuff these days. I may get back into it. But uh, that was kind of the idea of where I started, and I aimed my my content at somebody seventeen to twenty five ish. Like the average age is probably fifty and up uh, on my channel, and I I missed that mark by a country mile. It's so I super interesting. I, I see that too, and it really kind of I don't know if you see this too that it really varies a little bit from bike to bike that you see these trends like that. I don't, I don't understand that, but, uh, <laughs> uh, I have a undying sense of humor and it shows up in just about every video. Uh, and most people think I'm kind of a dork about it. I don't care. Whatever. I'm too old to care about, uh, what people think. So, you know, if you don't like my channel, 
don't let the door hit you where the good Lord split you. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the stories, uh, we don't have to go through the whole thing, but I seem to remember a certain story that you shared on your channel just to give people a little bit of a example of what they might expect. A certain military base. And, military uh, base? Yes. I know that wasn't you, but... Was there a military base in your father or something like that? And then the apple didn't oh, fall too hard. Oh, the Vespa story? Yeah. Oh, that one. Yeah. Um, I wasn't living with him. It was just my stepfather and my dad. My dad rode ever since he was old enough to get a license. And because he was a test pilot, he quit riding. And uh, um, because if you break an arm or a leg, you're out of a job. Mm. And, uh, so the threat was real to ride a motorcycle and, and lose your ability to test fly, uh, you know, all these marvelous planes. But during that era, he had a Vespa to get around on the va base. And, uh, this was in the fifties. I wasn't even no early sixties. And he was riding back home from the base. He was still married to my mother. I wasn't even born yet, so the, the, it wasn't my stepmother. Sorry, I'm mixing up the time frame. But anyway, the MP, the military police, started chasing him. Apparently, he was speeding or something of that nature. And again, when you're an officer in the military at that time and you get a speeding ticket, what makes you think you can handle our millions-of-dollar airplane and you can't handle a Vespa across the base and not get a <laughs> ticket? And he didn't want to hear that speech, so he outran him, and it turned into a, a big chase scene. And uh, uh, so he went out on the runways. He was on this Vespa, ducking in and out of airplanes, hiding behind the wheels and ducking under wings. And he finally shook the military police, and then he got back home, and he told it, my mom to open up the front door, and he wheeled that Vespa in, and he rattle canned it a different color. Plausible uh, deniability? <laughs> well, it was kind of uh, <laughs> the uh, first uh, version of uh, Grand Theft Auto. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so then, and it, the next day he took the Vespa out and it was a totally different color and it turned into another chase scene. So uh, he politely ditched him again and took it back home. And he's like, the Vespa's got to go. It's, <laughs> too, it's hot right me in too much now. trouble. It's a heat <laughs> score. Okay, yeah. so then the apple doesn't seem to fall far from the tree because I seem to also remember a different story where you were riding a certain vehicle where you, on another public institution land, where you weren't necessarily supposed to be riding either. Hey, Ben, a veteran biker is here, and he just dropped a $10 bomb on you. That's yes, very kind of you, Ben. That I is very, very, much appreciate very kind. It. I don't know how to make it pop up on the screen, so I'm very sorry that I can't really acknowledge that on the screen like I should, but first time kind of doing this, so sorry, guys. But very thank you very much. So you're asking about me getting high into school. trouble in high school. <laughs> oh my God. That was a whole nother chapter in my life of things I wish I hadn't done. I had a 1977 RD 400 that I rode to high school every day. Long and the short of it is I was a skinny tall drink of water. looked like a string bean at six foot four, about 135 pounds. And, uh, uh, just a nothing in high school, uh, kind of a dorky, period of time in my life we've all and been there, i got man, the bar especially me i know i know exactly how it is i was not the jock star i was not the king or queen of the prom i was just this string bean dude trying to get along <laughs> and i i was in california because i wrote my dad a letter and asked if i could come live with him and get to know him so that's how this was in southern california and uh anyway i got the bright idea of riding my motorcycle down the uh we didn't have a, an actual structure that was a school it was bungalows and they housed like six classrooms in each bungalow and they all kind of connected and made a quad and uh anyway I, I i fired up the bike ring ding 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 and off i went up the stairs and i uh the doors were open we didn't have air conditioning in that school so the doors were always open so i didn't have to get any of my friends to hold the doors open for me i was fortunate about that and class was in session so i roared down that hallway with those two-stroke pipes popping and then down the front steps of the school when i left the bungalow and as luck would have it long beach police department was cruising by <laughs> 
And that turned into a chase scene, and I hopped a curve on a golf course that was a couple blocks away, figuring they wouldn't chase me in there. And they did. They hopped right on their cruisers right over and chased me right across that golf course. At that point, I knew the jig was up, so I just pulled over and turned the bike off, politely turned it off, and we all know what happened there. I got hauled away in cuffs. Dad got a phone call at uh, McDonnell Douglas, come get your son. He had to land the plane. He's in a hot water here, and we got to deal with this. And uh, the ass chewings uh, went downhill from there for a long, long time after that. But like, uh, say, they just inspired too much fun. But you know, for a brief moment, it was worse. One of the worst things I ever did. But for once in my life, I was the man in high school, and and you know, I was just amazing. amazing. Oh yeah, fuck. That's every that's every student with a motorcycle's wet dream right there. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we didn't have cameras to film it back then, so, uh, you know, there you go. Speaking of cameras, uh, and I see we got a lot of moto vloggers, people who follow moto vloggers in here. So, yeah, thank you, guys. Uh, as soon as I get my stuff together, I'll figure out how to chat and talk to you at the same time here. Um, but I wanted to ask, I know you just came back from Australia a couple months ago now, a few months ago. Um, uh, well, yeah, um, about three four months ago maybe? yeah and you met a ton of moto vloggers out there how how was that isn't that amazing yeah um, you're you're apparently like mr popularity over there <laughs> uh i've helped a lot of those people and given them shout outs and i've talked with them on the sides to uh you know t- you know give them some tips and tricks on some of the editing i do things of that nature which is my editing is kind of weird but uh uh, I was absolutely flabbergasted. Uh, the Kazumoto, Leanne, and Gary uh, set up a meet and greet. Twenty-two people showed up, all moto vloggers, and or, or moto vloggers and their spouse. And uh, uh, it was just amazing. That's amazing. I, I barely like twenty-two people. So <laughs> that was in Sydney, and then we went to Cairns because we wanted to snorkel the Great Barrier Reef. I met up with two others. Moz 42 and Aussie one talk. And then we went to Western Australia and that was to meet a viewer. I've traveled and you need to realize how large Australia is to go from Cairns. We had to fly back to Sydney at eight o'clock in the morning and then across the country and landed at nine o'clock at night. That's how it's like further than going across coast to coast Canada or the United States. So it's a big damn deal to go out there and it's kind of barren wasteland out there in, in, in Western Australia. But I wanted to meet Alan, who was the very first person who ever wrote me a letter when I started my YouTube channel three years ago and he had enclosed, he, he supported what I was doing and he sent me a baseball cap that's had it, you know, Australia on it. And that meant the world to me that, kept me going when there were a lot of times I'm like to heck with this and just throw in the towel. Yeah. Cause you so, spent all the hours and then you see like 12 views. <laughs> it's like, fuck. <laughs> y- yeah. Well, that's kind of where I'm at now, even with 5,000 subs, you know, my videos are getting 200 views. It's just tanking and yeah. I'm mixing it up and trying to change it up some and, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens there. But, uh, um, uh, with that said, I got, Alan and, and another uh, viewer, Brian, uh, set up a motovlog meet up there, and I got to meet Outback Outlaw, an American who's traveling in, in Australia now. It used to be Robin the Lady Biker. She renamed her channel, calls it Moto by Chance. Uh, two Digby's or Digby's Down Under, other, under, I believe they changed their name, and several others. So I... I'm blown away. I'm a humble man and I don't understand why these people want to meet some absolute stranger from Virginia who just switched on a camera in his garage. I don't get that. Uh, I guess, I guess up. you're, uh, I guess you're halfway interesting then. Eh? I, I, I don't know. I, I'm sure <laughs> we'll I've find out. a few on that trip. We'll find out. Throw, throw a thumbs up. If you think Kraken's an interesting guy, throw a thumbs down. If he's not, how about that? Borrow a line from you. Actually, I'm going to borrow a line from you that I've seen you ask people on your channel. If you could have, I'm probably going to butcher your line. Sorry, buddy. Uh, If you could have any motorcycle, new, used, past, present, whatever, given to you, which one would it be? I used to have a a Confederate. They're now combat motors, and I've talked about that. I'm kind of sour on the company on some of their actions and the way they've handled myself 
extenuating story there. I've shot a video on it, but uh, if I could have any motorcycle right now, it would probably be an Indian Springfield. Okay. You know, and, and, and if I got that, it would be to get rid of my Harley because I'm burnt out on Harley and their antics, you know. I have so. some Carly questions coming up for you, so I'm glad I'm glad you said that. We might uh, we might we might touch. Angel upon that a is bit. asking me to address Jasmine, who's going to Australia tomorrow. Um, is it Jasmine or Jasmine? I w- want to make sure I'm pronouncing your name appropriately. My best advice to you is learn to do this a lot, and it's the national way of saying hello to one another because the flies over there are so aggressive and bad you won't believe your the flies go up your nose they go behind your glasses if you wear glasses they are incredibly uh aggressive flies so brace yourself for that you're gonna love australia the people couldn't be any nicer uh there's so much to see jump in and soak up as much culture and food as you can that's my advice to you out of all of your kind of adventures and trips, just the bike related ones, at least was Australia your favorite or do you have other favorites from the past? Cause you got quite a collection to look through. My wife and I do a lot of traveling globally. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, we're running out of time as we get older. So you, you have to see the world before you, you physically aren't able to, you know, who, or who knows? Mm-hmm. Uh, Australia was, shot right up to the tops on my list and that's because of the interaction and the people and i walked away with lifelong friends that was a life-changing experience i'm blown away at the gratuity that people showed my wife and i and how much they opened their doors and their lives to us there's a reason why a lot of those videos on australia are just slideshows i'm I, i'm not going to turn on a camera with people i just met it's not going to happen and you got to kind uh, of enjoy it too, right? Like I did the ride across Italy and I was correct. like, it could have been so much easier for storytelling if I had the camera rolling all the time, but sometimes it's better to just have it for you. Right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, uh, with that said, it shot right to the list. Uh, before that, I've been all over Europe. I've ridden on many parts of Europe, Italy, uh, Switzerland, Germany, et cetera. Um, uh, my wife can't ride with me anymore due to medical reasons. She had abdominal surgery and she can't take the jostling now. So I'm a solo rider and I'm not going to travel with my wife and leave her somewhere for me to go ride a bike. And that's never going to happen. That's fair enough. So traveling and riding is not going to happen. So I, I do day or week trips all centered from home now. Um, uh, somebody suggested to me uh, when I was, posting my Australia trips, I ought to travel and make my way across Canada to meet everybody. And I'm like, you know, I'm going to have to kick that one around, you know, and break bread with them and have dinner. And I want to hear about their story and their lives and and meet them and shake their hand. You know, um, it's a, it's a small world and, and I find great joy from that. I want to bring so. it back to, uh, to the past actually, cause I'm just, Bringing it back to family, I probably should have asked you this earlier. So you were, you know, you, I guess I'm curious, did you get, it sounds, did you get Anne, your stepmother into riding or your father did, or how did, how did that all come about? Yeah, how, how that went out? down, I had just bought that RD 400 that I got thrown in jail and impounded and all that. So it was in lock and chains in the garage for six months while my license got suspended and dad said, well, well, we got to keep it running. He hadn't been on a bike in a long time because of his career. So he unchained it and took my RD out, and he came back grinning, and he said, holy cow, this bike is fast. Because it was a two-stroke, and when you got on the pipe, it, it was fast. And uh, the the bug rebit him. He went out and bought this geeky Honda 350. I'll never forget it. Ann and I talked about it in one of the videos I shot of my stepmom, but it was a Honda 350 and it had this great big oversized windshield on it. And I guess somebody that worked at McDonald Douglas was a square dancer. So right in the center of the windshield, it had a square die cut square dancer sticker on it. And, um, he brought this thing home and I'm like, dad, I don't want to be seen in public with you on that (laughs) thing. I'm out. I'm out. (laughs) 
And uh, anyway, that lasted about a month, and he realized how underpowered inline four was at that time. And he went out and bought a uh, GS 1100, which was the fastest bike in the world in that time, in the late 70s. And my stepmother said, he and I started going on rides, and she's like, hey, you guys are having all the fun. I'm going to get into it. So she started riding and bought a twin star and yada, yada, yada. And finally, those two had a life-changing experience due to me opening that, reopening that door to dad. And they enjoyed 40 years of riding together. So you mentioned, traveled all over the world. You mentioned the 70s. It made me think of, uh, there's an episode of that 70s show where Red and Foreman, they get a little Honda. And uh, I can't help but wonder, and I feel like you're a good guy to ask, were families a little bit more family, sorry, were families a little bit more motorcycle friendly back then than you think they are now? Or were there other factors involved? That's a tough question. If you ask my mother, the answer is hell no. If you ask my dad, <laughs> I had to, I, I was destined to be on two wheels. I knew this from six, seven, eight years old. A friend of mine let her ride his, his Briggs and Stratton mini bike. And I, I was done. I was done forever. It changed my life that day. So I knew I was going to get into it. It was a matter of when, and I was able fortunately to let my talk, my dad into let me, letting me get a motorcycle the day I got my driver's license at 16. And, uh, so with that said, maybe dad pop was a little more open-minded than most parents. Mm -hmm. Um, he put limitations on me of CCs and he wouldn't let me get a, a, I wanted to get the, uh, remember the old Honda two stroke dirt bike trail bikes, uh, Elsinore's I want to say. Yeah. Okay. 175 or something like that. He's, yeah. Yeah. Uh, now I wanted an Elsinore 250 okay. and he wouldn't let me get it. Knobby tires aren't going to work on the street. Wide handlebars. You're putting yourself in danger. We had all these discussions and I finally closed him in on the RD 400 and I, I went and bought that bike. So with that said, I think the road, I think you still got pushback because there is, there was no real gear back then. Yeah, I had a helmet, but there was, there was no armor. There was no, you know, you wore blue jeans and a leather jacket. That's it. So that's a, that's a tough question. A long winded answer. I apologize, but hopefully. you. No, get I, think, I think, I think I get it. I also think there's there's so much there. Cause I think even just the, the, the nature of, of families are, we don't maybe have the same kind of atomic family as the average family now that we did back then. And, and it was numbers different then versus world. now. Yeah, it totally was. Absolutely. Because yeah. mom stayed at home and baked bread and, and took care of the kids and big daddy went off to work and wasn't that type of gal, but I'm telling you, that's the way the world was Yeah, yeah. back then. Uh, it was leave it to beaver type thing. And, uh, and was worked at, uh, in LA at a, at a hospital in an e ER as an, uh, a nurse and the dinner conversations about what happened on that table was on over the top. Good God. What well, was LA was dragging in, bleeding, poked or stabbed or wounded or shot and, Fun. uh, her <laughs> telling about it. But, uh, so we have an unusual family. What can I say? Uh, it's a colorful family. Let's say. If you could, if you could give that younger Eric uh, a piece of motorcycle-related advice, what would it be? Maybe Eric, who's only been riding about five years, who who knows a little bit, but maybe not necessarily enough. Eric, who's now is not sixteen but twenty-one. At that point, I was beyond repair. I thought I knew it all. I thought I was uh, Kenny Roberts. That's the that yep. era of. Uh, Valentino Rossi. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought I was Vale, and uh, I there was no telling me what to do or what not to do. I was very closed minded and thought I knew it all. So I think the cows were out already out of the barn. It wasn't until I got older and wiser before I realized what a d bag I was during that era in my life. Yeah, I, I don't think I was ever stupider than 23 because I know I was stupider, but I, at 23, I'm I was. I'm not going to lie. I'm telling you the truth. But yeah, I'm no. no angel. <laughs> I, I was no angel in that chapter in my life. So totally, totally know what you mean. So what what, uh, what advice would you get? Just simmer the fuck down and you don't quite know as much as you think you do or what? Um, 
my advice would be you're going to wreck. You better invest some money in some gear because you're going to die, son, at the, on the road you're traveling right now. Yeah, fair. And uh, I can talk to you and give you dad speeches till I'm blue in the face. Not going to help you. You're 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 beyond that. So wear gloves, wear boots, try to buy something that is going to protect you. <clears throat> Sticking with the then versus now uh, kind of questions. Do you find a different mindset between motorcyclists kind of getting into it now versus getting into it when you got into it? I do. Uh, I, I do. Back, back then, America wasn't so populated. So the average middle income, income had an acre or two of houses. They weren't racked and stacked in cookie cutter houses like they are today. It wasn't uncommon for families to have a mini bike a cub 50 or something like that to run around in the backyard or that Briggs and Stratton bike. That was the norm back then. These days, these kids aren't exposed to that on any level. And, uh, if they want to get into motorcycling, uh, unless their parents have deep pockets and can get them into dirt bike racing or track riding. I mean, that's, that's a lot of money and, and a big ask of your parents. My parents didn't have the money. It would never have happened. It's so weird because it's both it's both harder and easier than ever to get into motorcycles, right? Harder in terms of financially, economically, and whatever, but easier because like fuel injection, you pop a new battery in there, the thing's going to fire up. You don't have to worry about carbs being gummed up after six months anymore. Um, you have access to so much more information. You're not having to read through the freaking book because there's some guy in a t-shirt on YouTube who's showing you how to do it halfway wrong, halfway right, you know, but at least it, it gets you through. So it's it is both easier and harder, I think. Uh, I I agree. Uh, that's part of the reason why I'm trying to share my knowledge. And 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 it's yesterday's drop was on how to how to get your starter set of tools. Saw that and, on the cheap. And and the point is that's aimed directly at that 20 year old. Don't be afraid to start wrenching. And here's how you can get the proper tools: buy a service manual and jump in. And you always have YouTube as a backup there. I promise you, somebody has posted a video on pretty much everything you're going to do. So you have a, a distinct advantage over what us old timers didn't have growing up. So I, I'm, I'm still trying to pave that road for that very individual. Same, but I got to put you on pause for one second. Did Angel just say she used to own 10 groms at the same time? Or just 10 Angel. groms in general? Angel, step away from the Oh groms. my God. <laughs> you need some help. Woman, Jesus. <laughs> 10 groms. Wow. I don't think they're at the same time. I think but she still, sold it and went damn. back. <laughs> 10 groms. I, am I reading that wrong? I don't know. That's crazy. Anyway, um, I thought that needed the You're special. You're going to have to change your channel name to Angel Grom. Holy. It's a, it's a whole real. flock. It's a whole fleet. Um Okay, do you want to hear uh, kind of one observation from me, which is entirely hypocritical, and I totally acknowledge Please this? Please do. I mean, it's tough to step out of your own body and view yourself on how you're perceived to the public. Yeah, so this is going to, Adrian's going to put his foot in his mouth right here, okay? Um, I noticed, it's not so bad now. I noticed when Instagram was really, really at its height, I'll say maybe five-ish years ago, a couple of years before COVID anyway, um, I felt like there was just a certain type that got into motorcycles just for the look at me, look at me pictures. And I realized that that is entirely hypocritical because I'm a freaking YouTuber who makes content on motorcycles for like thousands of people. Um, but to me, it just seemed like there was all of a sudden this, we were so happy to ride absolute shit boxes that we were just happy if we could get them to start and run 100%. good right yeah it even, was paid even, i only for. started it 17 mine. years ago but it was it was paid for it was mine the carbs were cleaned recently it should be okay right like that was happiness right and and you know like some of the stuff was held on by zip ties and whatever right and then i just i saw like this wave of people who came in at that time and it just seemed to me like it was really all about doing it for the gram and uh i don't see that as much now which is kind of nice but for a while, it was like, whoa. And within a couple of years, they kind of faded in, took 60 zillion pictures with their bikes. And then three years later, they were out of it, never to be seen again at any bike meet. So I think C19 yeah. had a lot to do with the group that came in and, and are abruptly have left in the last year or so. Sorry, what was that? Uh, COVID. 
Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I, th- uh, I think that had a lot to do with the the, the genre of mm. motorcyclists that popped up on social media on all levels, and now they're pretty much ghosted and gone. Which we'll, we'll talk about the community later. We'll, <laughs> we'll we'll get to that. Um, I guess on that note, uh, in each of your videos, you try and grow the online motorcycle community by at the end giving a special shout out to a rider i feel like you do that in almost all of your videos pretty much i've given um, over 200 shout outs yes yeah that was that was kind of my question because i was just trying to do the mental math I'm like each shout out is at least a couple minutes times hundreds of videos times the time recording that editing that that's got to be a crazy amount of hours and uh, i guess to light a little bit of fire under some of these guys' asses in case they're watching this what percentage do you think gives you a shout out back what percentage of of what because what percentage of them give you a shout out back and i know you're not the type to keep scores but that's why i'm going to ask because less than one percent really less than one percent even watch my channel damn the few that do pop in and and skip through it and leave a generic remark and move on and i'm, yeah. I'm not hating on them i well, when it's I very give interesting a shout out, let me be clear here when i give a shout out there's no strings attached yeah it's a it's it's a a a genuine gift from the heart to help the motor vlog community. I don't care if they watch my channel. I'm, I'm an unusual channel. So not everybody's going to like my content. And I get that. I have zero expectations. So there's zero, butt hurt here. I could mm-hmm. care less. I would rather the ones that pretend to watch and leave a generic remark. Don't watch unsubscribe and go away. Cause you're killing my, my numbers. Yeah. You know, doing that, honestly, either, either you're in or you're out. That's, that's my humble opinion. Yeah. So, you know, it doesn't matter if I pay, put an eight minute video up, I get four minutes worth of viewing time. If I put a 20 minute view it up, you get 10, I get 10. Yeah. It's just the way it is. <laughs> yep. So I, 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 I tried shortening them down to two minutes and four minutes. I get a four minute video. I get two minutes of viewing. It's just, it. Welcome to YouTube. It, it, it really is, is what that. it is. It is that. So with these people, I mean, the the flip side of that coin is I recently unsubbed from about 300 channels. And uh, many of them I gave shout outs to and I subscribed to them. Mm-hmm. And they're on my feeds, their their videos would show up and I'm not I'm not really enjoying it. Why am I still sub to them? So I I I I, I kind of wire brush my my uh uh channels that i've subbed to and just stick to the ones that i enjoy for which your yours is one of them hey. sincerely. yeah thanks man appreciate no that. no well you made the cut you know but uh, <laughs> I, 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 I can't consume it all it's too much and nor can anyone else that's a moto vlogger you cannot consume it all it's not possible do you think moto vlogging is dying yeah 100 percent. yeah what's killing it uh it was cliche and new when it hit the scene it got mm-hmm. really old really quick as ten thousand people are fighting wind noise and buffeting and uh just terrible ums and not editing it out and properly or whatever and people got burnt out on it so yeah. what little motor vlogging i do i do a hybrid where i'm going down the road and the topic i'm talking about as i'm riding down the road i'm putting up sc- shots and i always try to end each video with a question i never propose a conclusion to anything that i post i don't say this is how i see it and and this is the way it should be these are my thoughts what are yours and let them come to their own conclusions people are very bright they'll figure it out I'm glad you said that because I have some questions to make you be the bad guy because you're always so oh, nice. No. Everybody says how nice you are. So I got some like purposely I feel negative like I'm getting questions. A cavity search here, man. <laughs> Bend over and spread them, son. <laughs> All right. Um, first, before we get to that, I mean, I'll just ask you, just because we're on the topic here, I'm just really curious. Uh, YouTube algorithm, good or evil? I think it's good. And as one that is always on the, uh, I'm the tail end on that dog getting wagged around because I'm never <laughs> going to fit the logarithm. And, but I say it's been good because there's legitimately an option for young folks who do fit their logarithm 
to go out there and legitimately get paid and make a living crush if they it. want to. Yep. Yeah. And crush it. I don't yeah. possess the I don't have the social media skills. I'm 61. You know? I took computer classes at Cal State on a uh, oh my god, what was that piece of crap computer? Um, it was even before DOS. Anyway, it doesn't matter, but the world has evolved and I've tried to stay with it as best I can. And I'm still currently feel like I have a good grip on it, but the youth that's coming up today, you, you can hand a nine year old, your, your cell phone, and they'll show you how to do your, your stuff on Facebook, Instagram, whatever that I don't even know. And that's facts. So you had to do everything, but your taxes. There you go. Yeah. So I have faith in that youth, and and I, I see this as a venue to propel motorcycling in social media, which will attract new flies. You gotta you gotta attract flies with honey. The problem is us old people don't have a whole lot of honey in our lives. All we got is salt. <laughs> you, <laughs> you you keep your honey where it is. You enjoy it, man. Um, I got some questions for you to make you be a bad guy, though. So we're gonna get into those ones. So. Don't look now, uh, but Miss Kraken is in some kind of trouble, and the only way you can save her is by telling me what three motorcycles you think are ugly. Oh, my God. <laughs> First one only lasted for one year, and it was produced by Harley Davidson. They actually named it the Confederate. Okay. If you, if you Google it, it has the most geeky dual seat you've ever seen, kind of this king-queen thing going on on this paint scheme that belongs on um, uh, Evil Knievel's bike. It, uh, to me, it's the most hideous bike I ever saw in my life. Not right. That's one. Second, that's one. Um, I think, wow, that's a tough one. There's so many bikes. Kawasaki came out with a, a um intimidator or something and it it was a belt drive around four or five hundred cc's and it had some stretch front end with some sport bike rear end that i thought was a total abortion and you know uh, uh that didn't last very long maybe one year or so um third bike these are all kind of weak so none of them are really epic that's okay. Uh, and I don't, I don't want to insult somebody. And I know, I'll, that's I'll, why I asked you on I'll, purpose. <laughs> I'll, I'll express on that. I'll, I'll, I'll explain my caveat on that at the end of this uh, just particular question. I would say the third bike I always disliked was Dad always, uh, back when he got into BMWs, I shot a video. He made a sport bike out of his BMW LT. They did not make an RS or, or any of the cool stuff. Again, this was a different era. You had to make your own crotch rockets back then. And he painted his like an F-14 Tomcat. I shot a video on it. It turned out really cool in the end. But his BMW LT 100, 100 LT, Whatever, luxury touring is what the LT stood for. And it was a thousand CC inline four, the flying brick. And that was hard bags and all the goodies and whatever. But it I, I was in my 20s and I thought it was a geek, geek mobile on two wheels. So there you go. All right. That works. Uh, I'll throw so, in a couple ones that uh, I was going to, I was going to throw in in case you needed a, an assist, but you got them all. Uh, so Miss Kraken is saved by the way. Good job. Um, Honda DN01 for me is just, it looks like a jet ski. Batmobile. That's why I like it. Really? Oh man. It looks like a bat bike. Oh God. Uh, I would rock that just to piss people off. <laughs> <laughs> and I would be there shaking my fist at you as you rode by every time. I swear, I swear <laughs> to God, I would put Batman ears on a black helmet and ride that bad boy around just to piss people off. I would pick you basically. You don't want any of that scooter, man. <laughs> yeah, I'd pick basically any BMW GS uh, because I ride a couple of GSs. But let's be real. They're not pretty bikes, right? Like, it is what it is. Right. Uh, and I, I don't know if I could think of a third one on the spot. So good on you for thinking of all three there. Yeah. Um, had a Harley on the list, so that's good. 
which motorcycle brand are you least likely to own? And none of the obscure ones, just kind of like top 10 brand, maybe. I, I'm a motorcycle whore, so you're asking the wrong person. You'll sleep, you'll I'll, sleep I'll, around. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I have had over 100 motorcycles in my lifetime. Okay. And in three years, people that have stuck with me on my channel have seen me flip bikes on several occasions. Yep. R18 is gone. Now I got a ZX4RR. I mean, you never know what I'm going to do because things pique my interest. I'm running out of uh, years to ride and whatever I want to do, nothing's going to stop me. And yep. I will sell my soul to the devil to go get it. That's just who I am. Uh, so with that said, I'm not a brand bigot in any way, shape or form. And part, part of what I wanted to touch upon the caveat regarding picking the three ugliest bikes. I don't want an age old rule or, or I should share. Everybody should know this or take it to heart. Never ever insult a man or woman's bike. And, and it, uh, how this co topic comes up is the old Harley wave. Do you get one uh, or do you not when you're on your BMW? You never get one when you're on a scooter. That's that's a fact. Um, you know, so with that said, when I see somebody riding some beater going by and, uh, uh, you know, some piece of crap motorcycle or whatever or even a moped or something, I wave to every single one of them. For all I know, that person has been fighting cancer for the last 20 years and yep. survived it and saved it up despite medical bills. And that's the greatest day they ever had in their life in the last 20 years. You don't know till you walk a mile and what in, in their shoes, what that person is going through. Wave people to every single person that you see on the road. That's my humble opinion. So that's why I didn't want to bash any motorcycles. That's why I told, that's why I knew I had to tell you that uh, Miss Kraken was in terrible danger. If you didn't answer the question, <laughs> I was like, Oh, I got to put him in an extreme situation or he's not going to want to answer this. <laughs> Let me see what else. Uh, would you go for another BMW again based on the R18? 100%. I yep. love the brand marquee. I don't agree. I'm not likely to. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with their their business model. They have eliminated service manuals for all BMWs. As I, saw you, I saw you did a video on that. As of 2021, and I'm, I'm a renter at home. And because I do my own services, I promise you, I have saved $50,000 in, in, in the last 45 years. Yep. And that's a chunk of change to me. I don't have deep pockets. I mean, a Harley, a BMW service, a Harley service is four or $500 these days. I don't have a half a grand for an oil change. So, you know? so just a quick recap for anybody who, who missed that. I think from what I remember from your video, BMW not selling service manuals to the public anymore. Is that correct? That is correct. That's crazy. That's that's wild. You are on your own. So yeah. if you want to change your own tire, you have no settings for what the torque settings are yep. to install your front wheel. Crazy. Think about that. Crazy. That's unacceptable. That's cutting out the consumer, and I think it's against the law. So that's my opinion. So for that reason, I won't own another BMW until they clean up their mess. You okay. pooped in the kitty box, and there's not enough litter, litter to cover this turd. Go get some more letter and get back to me. I know it's probably going to be hard for you to answer this one, but uh, so maybe you can pick up top three again if you want. Favorite motorcycle that you have owned, currently own, have owned, whatever. You can pick one, three, whatever it is. RZ350, Kenny right. Roberts edition, Bumblebee yellow and black. Mm -hmm. uh, RD400, the two-stroke, I'm an adrenaline. When that two-stroke kicks in and you have two cylinders and it, it wheelied in the first four gears, it was unbelievable. You could not keep the front wheel on the ground. It was just mainlining adrenaline. And yet the brakes sucked, the handling sucked, the suspension sucked. I don't care. The bike was that much fun. <laughs> Uh, I can fix all that by today's standards, but we're talking a long, long time ago. Uh, Palmetto Green BMW K1100 RS. That one's outside right. of my head. Yeah, say that one more time for me. I got to Google that one. <laughs> Sport Touring Bike yep. by BMW, the K1100 RS. The Rally okay. Sport is what the RS stood for. Gotcha. And that bike. Aside from it burning the inside of my thighs, uh, uh, that was a terrible part of that bike. But the, the 
they nailed the body work. They nailed the handling. They nailed the power band. That bike just was amazing for me. And I just, I just, I put a hundred thousand miles on that bike. Nice. It's, and I know, and, and, I, and I'm a bike or normally they're gone because I rode so much, so many miles in my lifetime, I would ride 50,000 miles before it depreciated too much. I could retain 60, 65% of its value of what I paid for it after I put 50,000 miles on it in two years. And, uh, so for me, it was an economic thing to get rid of it before when you get into 70, 80, 90, a hundred thousand, you own a brick. Yep. It's not worth anything. No, nope, it's not. Um, that's my opinion. Yeah. 506 ADV says, uh, Loves his R9T, but will never buy another BMW. Being required to take the bike into the dealer once a year to spend a hundred bucks just to turn off the service reminder drives him insane. Yeah, that's it, there is that GS911 tool that you can look up. Um, it is pricey though, but the tool's expensive. But if you're committed to sticking with BMW, buy the damn tool and turn the light off and change your own oil and move forward. Enjoy life is short. If that's the bike that melts your butter then step up to the plate and get it handled and enjoy the damn bike. Yeah. Uh, Does that coming make down sense? To my, coming down to my last couple questions and then we can kind of close out. We're blowing through them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> um, I guess, what do you see as something that any of the big four Japanese brands are really doing right right now? ZX4RR, a blast from the late 80s to early 90s, an inline 400cc that rev lines at 16,000 RPM is so much fun. And and I, Kawasaki was brave to put that out, let alone have have quick shifter on it and quick downshift on it. Uh, those are it. It's also. Uh, um, got the ram air on it it has super bike functions on it in a 400 cc package i hope yamaha and honda get back into that because those were amazing bikes that rarely ever make it to the shores of north america the rest of the world has had these bikes heck kawasaki makes a zx 25r and that's a 250 cc inline four mm -hmm. that rev lies at like twenty thousand rpm it's unbelievable and and to say you can't have fun on 250 cc's i beg to differ if you had the right bike yep absolutely uh I so know, that, would, still, that would be my answer yeah are you still in the loop I'm, on harley stuff harley i i'm good where i'm at uh i like my uh icon revival it's nothing but an electric glide with a, a, a paint job and yep a tractor seat on it with you know it's 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 a good looking bike, but there will come a day when I can't throw around in the garage nine hundred pounds. Mm -hmm. Make no mistake, I'm eight and a half years away from being seventy. Think about that. So that's that's scary to me. And uh, so you're with barely sixty. Said, then. <laughs> sixty-one. I'll you're be barely, sixty-two. You're barely, and, if we're counting in decades, you're barely sixty. So. <laughs> All right. Well, I've have a few revolutions around the sun. <laughs> let's put it that way. But uh, what's what's Harley doing right right now? Not a whole lot. <laughs> I can End say one story. thing. I can say one thing. They got rid of that Street Five Hundred and Street Seven Fifty, and I know that's going to upset Australia, people. In Australia, in Australia, that bike was a huge hit. They couldn't really? keep them in stock. Really, hundred percent. Huh. I was, was an, India made Harley. I was working for Harley Davidson Canada when it came out. And I remember, see, I think Harley should make a midsize entry level bike. I have no issues with that. I had an issue with the fit and finish wasn't where I wanted it to be. And overall, I just didn't like the aesthetic of it. And I remember I was working for oh. Harley Davidson at the time and Harley and my boss over there was like, this is when we we're going to come see it in person for the very first time. And she's like, isn't it great? And I was just kind of like, yeah, but really inside, I was like, no, this is terrible. Well, Harley actually has rebadged Benelli's now yes. for the rest of the world. And yeah. in North America, they're using them for the uh, uh, their their MSF classes to learn how to ride. And those are Chinese-made 
Italian branded bikes rebadged as Harleys. So Did you get all that people <laughs> think about that. Yeah. So, so my, my argument with Harley, my brother-in-law tells a wonderful story. The first Harley he bought was in Wyoming and it was uh, snowing and he walked in, this is a mom and pop shop. And there was this showroom had four bikes on it. It was a different world back then. And there was a low rider there and he said, I'd like to demo that bike. And, and, the counter person's like, well, you know, it's snowing. We normally don't take them off the showroom. He reached in his pocket and put a lot of money on the counter. He said, I'm trying to buy this bike today, son. And the guy, the owner came out of the back. The owner was wrenching on bikes. He was the service manager and owner. Get this bike off the showroom. Get this man a demo right immediately. And he bought it. And when he bought it, he was given a T-shirt, a repair manual, and uh, two oil kits and a hearty handshake and thanks for your business. Now think about the Harley experience today and you've worked in the dealership. So I think yep. you understand what I'm saying. Yep. You get a tour through the boutique these days. If you get a t-shirt, they have a separate rack of the old cheapo shirts. Yep. Oh, you want the real deal? You got to pay for those. Yep. These generic ones over here that have our name on the back. You can pick from one of those, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It has changed from an environment where the middle class is almost it used to be blue blue collar and they raise their prices raise their prices now it's middle class bikes have gotten so expensive middle class almost can't afford them anymore it it's it is like that and i don't know that harley too it's i mean it's it's easy to point finger at harley because they're so big and because all the branding and everything but the mentality of a lot of places really is get them to buy all of the gear and then just tell them, you know, you can add it into your vehicle purchase that you're making payments on. So it's not really that you're spending a thousand bucks on Harley branded gear because you're spending that thousand bucks over 12 payments for five years at 60 payments. What's a thousand divided by 60? It barely adds anything to your cost, right? <laughs> Meanwhile, you've just spent a thousand bucks on a jacket and a pair of boots and a t-shirt. One year ago, I met this guy who was a general manager of a Harley dealership. I won't say where. I'm not here to character assassinate anybody. But he said, on every sale of a Harley in our dealership, if we don't gross 10000 profit, you're fired. Wow. That includes <laughs> jackets, chromium tidbits, extended service policies, um, gap protection, hiked up interest rates for 84 months, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. For anybody watching this, this is why Adrian did not like being on the sales floor. Bingo. Uh, yeah. I, 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 when I posted, I had, this was during COVID. I bought my Icon Revival. This is a rare bike. Only 1,500 of them made from a dealership up in Maryland. Back then during COVID, it was not uncommon to have digital signing. That became real because uh, you were worried about catching COVID, mm -hmm. uh, you know, interacting with people. And, uh, the, that turned into a two day process to buy that bike. I had to go get a hotel and return in the morning and there's extending the circumstance of that. But where I'm going with this discussion is they pre-sign my name on the contract with an extended service policy of $2,500 in there with gap protection in there with, with, um, an environmental protection paint seal and protection package in there and pre sign my name on the contract and handed it to me. And I said, I didn't sign this. You're like, what the hell is this? Yeah. Yep. So if you push back too hard, they just throw you out. They got 10 other people trying to buy the bike. Crazy. So I sorted that, got it handled. They would not sell me the bike unless I financed it through, through Harley credit. She bumped the interest rate of what was quoted with an 825 beacon score, a point and a half. Mm -hmm. Okay. This was lying, scamming, cheating, go to jail type stuff, fraud. All right. This is my last Harley experience of buying the bike of my dreams. Just the fact so, that no. they, just the fact that they wouldn't sell it to you. If you I had posted cash, two they, had to, they, part they had to sell it to you on, on, uh, you, they had to make you. Uh, pay for it on uh, on credit is i is, posted two that's against the law adrian 
It you is. can't force people. Uh, is, but so, you know why? They get kickbacks on that. Both the dealership of, and of course the salesperson gets kickbacks on that. Of course they do. Greasy. So I posted two videos on it and I called up the general manager and I said, here's, give me your email address. I'm going to email you two videos. If I hear any lip service or pushback from you, my next phone call will be the attorney general and they will come visit you and people are going to be hauled away in cuffs. Do you understand me, sir? And he's like, you know, F off, uh, whatever, dude, and hung up and I never heard another word from him. This is actually kind of the perfect segue because my final question for you was, uh, the year is 2029, and you and I are having our fifth annual uh, Easter celebration together. And uh, what's what's in Eric's garage in five years? A Vespa. Okay. Maybe an updated 946. I can't stand the new colors now. They're horrific. Yep. With the uh, Chinese Easter bunny on it. Um. Do you know which one I'm talking about? Yeah, I know that was last year's. Now they got a dragon, but it's not even like an aggressive like raw dragon. It's like the like the dopiest little derpy little dragon. I haven't seen that one. I saw 2024s with the same thing as last year. It's not any better than the rabbit. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to check it out. Yeah, I see a vest. Pardon me. I see a Vespa in my life. I will always have a Vespa, mm -hmm. not because of my heritage with my dad evading police or anything like that. I genuinely <laughs> love the brand and the history of it. And they're beautiful. Uh, and they're they fun. are that much fun. Yeah. Um, Agreed. I will downsize from a 900 pound bike because I have had back surgery and I, I won't be able to take it. Mm -hmm. uh, so with that said, probably some sort of sporty bike, something like the ZX44 that's reasonable. I don't need an R1. I don't need a... Um, an H2 or something like that. That I, my days of doing those kind of stupid speeds, going up to a ton on a ZX44 4 RR is enough for me, and that's that's enough to get my jollies. So there you go. There we go. Um, probably something like a a, a Honda uh, CT125 Trail 125. Yeah. I just wish they would go a little faster than 45 miles an hour. That's a problem and puts me in harm's way to even ride it around my area. Hey, we might have some big board kits by then. You know what I mean? If there aren't already some out now. True. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, I just want to say uh, thank you so much. I know we've been talking about doing this for months, many, many months, but uh, I'm glad we kind of finally got our stuff. I got oh, my stuff stop. together to have you. So I'm open to help anybody out. And uh, why anybody wants to talk to me is absolutely amazing. So I haven't really seen uh, 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 Craig saying it would be great to see you again. So I hope to see him in the near future. I've had several YouTubers swing by and stay at our home. And uh, Craig and Lucinda of Sh Sh Moto Travels, uh, for Canadians, by the way. Yep. Uh, uh, I've had. Uh, Artist on a Harley and Pete and Bonnie. I've had uh, Purple on three. I've had several YouTubers come by, and and, and it, I'm happy to open up my home to people and on their travels uh, that are traveling down south and get a free night and you know, nice dinner and have have some nice drinks and and a nice meal. So there you go. Cool. Well, Eric, uh, Eric's very humble, but check him out. He's got a lot of awesome content on his uh, channel. Uh, and adventures. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't i wouldn't say that he does check uh, him out everybody who came out do you guys have any like, questions for us we got like two minutes left here if you guys have any questions or angel anything always has a question and you oh, know for that. sure Eric, what for is sure. It, what is it like to meet purple on three and tommy psp tommy g they are personal best friends at this point in my life it was a positive experience opening up why they took me up on it on this long-haired guy with tattoos that rides vespas and harleys i i will never understand but uh they're top shelf uh i i can't speak highly of them enough if they are in your area or you have a chance to cross paths go out of your way and go meet them you won't regret it there you go the signal is getting weak and so are the and now has sunsets getting out of machu so he's in peru craig is in peru uh Shh, motor travel so Ugh. god it's what a small world hmm. he and uh, lucinda have been doing south america and just loving life and getting out of the snow of canada so 
We're scared to death of you, Eric. <laughs> How rude. We won't talk talk about when I went to get visit them. Why don't Jade Jody you explain on a live stream how I almost got tased in the nutsack? <laughs> <laughs> Leanne has a question. Did you Chestnuts love Australia? Roasting. I I I loved Australia more than I ever thought I would. Uh, I got to see three different sides of your beautiful country. My only regret is I didn't get to see Tasmania. Uh, what I wasn't prepared for was the people make your country so great. And uh, Americans could learn a lot about your lifestyle, your patriotism to your country, and how you roll. And uh, uh, I, I mean every word of what I say from my heart. You guys are awesome. So uh, maybe I just hit the lottery and met all the good apples. I'm sure there are bad ones out there, but I didn't meet any. So there you go. Hopefully I answered that, uh, Leanne. Leanne is from Kazomoto. Her and Gary chaperoned us and took care of us on our leg in Sydney. More than you will ever know. I am indebted to them for life, and I love them to death. They're amazing, amazing people. And uh, they have a massively large family, and uh, they're just uh, amazing. And Gary has been writing as long as I have. So uh, huge respect for Gary as well. So we still live? Yeah, uh, we're still live. All right. All right. You remember his name, Nice. At Purple, I, I don't know what that means anyway. So anyway, well, go ahead. I'm good, man. Our, uh, I hope everybody enjoyed uh, Adrian's artwork on the thumbnail. I sent him a goofy <laughs> pic and he to be obnoxious and he volleyed right back with a goofy picture of him. So there you go. You know, you threw I the alley oop and I dunked it, man. That's how we got to do it. it. <laughs> I want to wish each and every one of you a happy Easter. Those of you that are in Australia are already celebrating us. Those of you who are in North America. Uh, happy Easter tomorrow, whatever you believe in. I wish you best, all the best in life, and much love from Virginia to each and every one that sees this video. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks to everybody for just checking out the chat and hanging out with us because that was uh, that was awfully nice of you guys. I know you got other places to be and stuff to do, and I know uh, Easter for some people is a big deal. For some people, it's not. And for some people, getting around your family just freaking absolutely sucks. So thanks for being here with us. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. And uh, Angel Face, I'm going to send you a link. Shoot me a message over here. Angel, get off your duff and start doing some streams for all these women you keep boasting. I was joking with Adrian. A quick story. Every time I comment on Adrian's videos, oh, Uncle Kraken, we don't do uh, guys. It's only girls. We only do Canadians. We don't do uh, Americans. And I'm like, calm down, Angel. It's all right. I don't have a kickstand, and I'm not born in Canada. It's all good. I'm just commenting on your videos. <laughs> Humphrey says hi, Uncle Kraken. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> uh, one of my weasel brothers in hey, the background. Hey, isn't that uh, when your pupper's telling you it's uh, it's time? <laughs> yep. Yep. No. All right, guys.